So what I'm <coughs> going to talk about uh, uh, pediatric lung recruitment. Uh, there's, uh, the problem is more or less defined between us and them, or uh, us uh, nurses and doctors versus the patient, and it is always the fight between ventilator adjustment and uh, uh, manipulation and get it right for the patient. So what happens is uh, most likely uh, we've done something to make the lung function worse or the patient is actually the one who has the disease. And that's, uh, in principle, uh, the, the approach that we need to take. So if we are on the, um, uh, on the side of, we've done something wrong, then simply don't do it. Or if you uh, have done it wrong, reverse it. So this is a very important approach uh, for mechanical ventilation. Don't do it or reverse if it's gone wrong. And then sometimes, of course, uh, we need to fix it because it's the patient, the one with the disease. And then sometimes we have to accept we can't fix it. So I'm going to talk about these uh, uh, different approaches and show you a little bit the evidence of what we actually can do and what we can't do. So the first uh, study is that we're saying, okay, uh, we've uh, done or we shouldn't do something to the lung. And we start to actually learn from adult evidence, and uh, <clears throat> there's quite a good literature out there now that if you use and don't or don't use uh, intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation, you improve outcome. So early intervention, early support of the respiratory system with non-invasive ventilation may indeed prevent intubation and that uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, that shows the early use of non-invasive uh, ventilation is uh, in benefit of intubation rate and length of stay. And we've got as well in, adult, uh, in pediatrics, similar to the adults, uh, some evidence that uh, this may actually be true and we have more work to do in pediatric. This is a, a group in uh, Spain who has shown that uh, early use in a randomized controlled trial that if you use it early in respiratory failure, you may have actually a, quite a significant reduction in the intubation rate. Uh, it, it's, it's a very important concept and of course we all know that, but we need to study uh, the efficacy of non-invasive ventilation on intubation rate, length of stay, as well mortality in pediatrics. Uh, we simply don't have the data there. Now, if we've done something to the lung that we shouldn't do, then we have to reverse it. Uh, so we need to reverse basically the damage or sort of the damage that we've done to the lung with a recruitment maneuver. Now, how, how do we do it? We've done a study uh, during uh, induction of uh, anesthesia in cardiac babies in our unit. So what happened here was uh, we uh, uh, applied electrical uh, impedance tomography that Peter was just talking about. So we get images of the lung as a cross-sectional area of the chest at nipple level. Uh, so you can read these pictures like a CT scan, but you see not structural, you see functional images, so you see where aeration is happening. So the baby here is breathing here, and then uh, the anesthetist is injecting uh, some uh, anesthetic drugs and is taking uh, the breathing of the baby over, uh, handbagging, and that's the moment of intubation. And then after intubation, it's handbagging uh, with a T piece. And then the patient is put on a mechanical ventilator or the anesthetic machine here. And you can see how the lung volume that we trace over that time period is changing. Uh, it's quite an interesting uh, graph here already. You see basically the normal tidal breathing, and then as soon as we take over the mask breathing, and uh, you see that the volume change that we apply with mask bagging is quite huge compared to the spontaneous breathing. We lose a lot of lung volume here during intubation, take it over, and then normalize or even increase then again the, the lung volume after intubation. So what happens to the pressures that we actually apply because uh, we are damn good with our hands and we know exactly how much pressure we apply. The anesthetist uh, didn't see the pressure measurements that we did, so that's just the so-called I know how to ventilate and how to bag a patient. You can see that the uh, so-called PEEP that's been applied by the TPs uh, over a face mask or endotracheal tube is moderately here there by around 5 to uh, 10. 
Uh, but you see the peak pressures are quite industrial if you don't monitor them. Uh, you can see that uh, the so-called I know how to bag is actually not the real thing. And these are then the pressures that the anesthetist dialed up on the ventilator prior to surgery. The same you can see here, these dots, they represent the change in index respiratory level. Uh, it's uh, basically the same, just the group data like the previous slide where we trace the lung volume. Uh, you see here during the intubation phase, the patient, of course, being paralyzed, loses a lot of uh, lung volume. So that's the de-recruitment that's happening, and that's what we're talking about. So if we do something to the lung, we need to reverse it, and we need to apply positive end expiratory pressure to the patient after intubation. Uh, it's quite surprisingly still that uh, many anesthetists these days are not using any PEEP during surgical procedures, despite there's uh, uh, plenty of knowledge that we should actually uh, recruit the lung. Uh, what Pe uh, Peter just showed in uh, his talk before is as well that as soon as you uh, ventilate a patient, the so-called center of ventilation is changing basically the posterior aspects of the lung are less well ventilated and the anterior ones are the ones that uh, are more likely to be ventilated. Uh, this is as well based on the electrical impedance tomography, the center of ventilation if at 50% that's in the middle of the chest and we know that during spontaneous breathing we have the dependent lung that's uh, better ventilated. You can see that the center of uh, ventilation is moving gradually anteriorly uh, we can see that as well here on this CT scan of a child that we put through the CT scanner. At zero PEEP you see these uh, uh, quite nasty atelectasis and uh, consolidation here. And by applying just 10, 10 centimeters of PEEP, we gradually start to recruit because here the center of ventilation is really just only in the anterior part. But once you start uh, uh, recruiting and opening up the lung, these posterior aspects are becoming ventilated then again. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, if you're going back in 74, uh, they described as well that uh, during and before anesthesia, the uh, so-called um, AA gradients um, uh, are massively changing. So you can see that as soon as you start mechanical ventilation, the patient is less well off. We have atelectasis. Now, during suction, for instance, that's a maneuver that we do quite commonly in ICU. You can see that uh, here the patient is breathing and then we disconnect and all of a sudden the lung volume disappears. And we uh, perform then the suction and then uh, suction and suction and then we reconnect. And you can see that the lung volume here after um, uh, suction has, has quite a, a lengthy deal of time to get back to normal or doesn't reach normal at all afterwards. So what uh, uh, Jackie in our uh, research group did was she basically was looking at uh, lung recruitment post-suction. Uh, she had a, a randomized controlled uh, crossover study uh, and uh, she investigated 20 controls and uh, 38 uh, in the intervention group. Uh, these are the patient characteristics. Uh, and here, that's uh, the study design, basically. Uh, it's a baseline suction. And she crossed over from suction to double, uh, suction and double peep to suction with an incremental peep. So that's how it works. Uh, the patient has been suctioned here. You can see during these suction maneuvers and handbagging, the lung volume starts gradually, gradually to drop. So we need to normalize that afterwards again and, and, and get it right. So we put the patient back to the previous peep and then just double it. Uh, put uh, as well uh, quite close attention to it, you can see that when you double the PEEP over time, there's a gradual, gradual incline of end expiratory volume. So uh, time is a Im very important factor as well. And the other intervention uh, that was uh, studied in the crossover was uh, an incremental PEEP trial up to 18 centimeters of water. And uh, you can see as well here the time factor uh, whenever you increase the, the PEEP is quite important. Uh, we've chosen these two maneuvers uh, for a reason, because they're simple and uh, easy to be used, so we didn't want to use any fancy recruitment maneuver, something that we in the future can use in our unit where we say, okay, after suction you just double the PEEP or you're doing an uh, incremental PEEP trial. Here are the results on uh, lung volume. And uh, here at the bottom are the finally uh, applied peeps. 
So the double PEEP had on average a PEEP of 15 and the incremental PEEP roughly 17, so a, a slight difference in PEEP in the end. But quite surprisingly, after uh, 60 to 120 minutes, the uh, group with the double PEEP had a much better inexpiratory uh, lung volume. And we assume that the time factor, because they spend on average a longer time at the higher PEEP, or on average a little bit higher PEEP, uh, so that the time plus PEEP plays quite a big role. Uh, so what we uh, suggest now for our own unit is uh, after suction, just double the PEEP with, a, of course, an upper limit, uh, and the upper limit was in the study of 18, uh, and uh, keep that for two minutes and uh, you should be all right. Now, uh, if the lung is the problem, then try to fix it. Uh, like uh, Peter just shown, that you should perform this uh, recruitment maneuver and we should actually open up the lung first and then ventilate the patient on the so-called deflation limb. I'm not going to into the detail, but we know that uh, we need lung volume measurements to actually assess uh, this uh, goodness of recruitment. Uh, as uh, uh, Peter just mentioned before, if we would have a nice microscopy on the long surface, uh, we can see if you look at uh, point A of a uh, pressure volume curve, uh, we don't have many alveoli recruited, whereas if you go to uh, point T, uh, D, after having reached point D, where all the alveoli uh, are nice and open, uh, we have a much uh, nice state of the lung and much more efficient lung ventilation. Another, another um, interesting paper by Anal uh, has shown the following as well. If you apply just a sustained inflation uh, over 30 seconds, or in total the whole maneuver lasted for roughly uh, 40 seconds, uh, you get over time a gradual volume increase. And uh, here he plotted all the individual patients. So some of these patients with ARDS, you know, they over time they recruit quite nicely, almost up to a liter. But a lot of these patients don't do a thing. So there's no recruitment at all happening. So they are the responders and the non-responders to recruitment. And we need clinical tools or measurement tools or monitoring tool that are actually differentiating the responders from the non-responders. Because if you have a non-responder in the pediatric unit, we very quickly say, OK, we can't open the lung, we can't oxygenate, we go very quickly to high frequency oscillation. And now high frequency oscillation is nothing else than we increase our PEEP to a CPAP machine and the oscillator is nothing else than a CPAP driver with an oscillation around that mean airway pressure. Uh, a, a lot of our colleagues would say, oh, I would never ventilate a patient with a PEEP of 20 or 25, but we are happy to use a CPAP driver at pressures of 20 to 30. And so what are we doing by using high frequency oscillation is just using massively PEEP or open up the lung, similar to what uh, Peter just shown before. So that leads me into the adult world, and uh, you've probably uh, read the latest uh, article or two articles in the New England Journal about uh, the use of HFO in the adults, and these were negative trials. Uh, I've been asked several times why, why is the, the adult experience with HFO so negative or hasn't shown any benefit? There are several reasons. Um, first of all, uh, I believe they made the same mistake like we did in pediatrics where we just thrown some oscillators into some uh, units not having had the experience. HFO use needs a lot of experience, especially from the nursing side, and they completely forgot the right heart. Uh, whereas uh, we, we don't have that many right heart problems in pediatrics, and uh, there's a significant problem. Then the sedation paralysis problems, that if you look at the, uh, what they used uh, in these adults, there's certainly a confounding factor here. And then as a pediatrician uh, or a pediatric intensivist, you know that HFO works quite well in the little ones. And as soon as it starts to be four, six, eight, ten years, ah, uh, HFO, let's give it a go, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. So there seems to be an age dependency of how HFO works. And now, bear with me just a few seconds with a little bit hardcore lung physiology, but I'll try to get you through there. Um, I'm, I'm a, a Bernese, a Swiss Bernese, and uh, the Weibel model has been developed in my hometown, so I'm very, very proud of uh, being a little bit part of it. 
Uh, this uh, lung model um, shows the branching of the lung, and we all learned that in medical school that uh, roughly after the 15th to 18th generations some uh, alveolar sacs are or acini are occurring. So that's the so-called anatomical lung model that we are basing our uh, functional understanding of the lung. Now, the functional lung model is a little bit different. Uh, we know, uh, for instance, that if you look at a rabbit or a rat, that the uh, acini are very, very high up in the bronchial tree. So the gas exchange in these, uh, for instance, in the rats, already starts occurring in the eighth generation of the bronchi. Uh, and in the rabbits, it goes further downstream. And we know that in humans, the gas exchange uh, we estimate, or adult, uh, uh, adult lung, is probably starting around the 20th or 18th generation. Now, what we learned is that the so-called convection diffusion front, that means if you have the understanding of gases flowing into the lung, so that's the tidal breath, and then there is a moment where basically the air is not flowing anymore and we transition into diffusion. And that's where the gas exchange is happening. It's the so-called silent zone within the lung. And it's a very important part of the lung because we have a bulk flow downstream and at some point there's no bulk uh, flowing or air flowing anymore, it's just diffusion. And this so-called um, convection diffusion front in animals, as uh, I said before, roughly starts at the 18th to 20th generation. And we know from physiological study, an infant has a much higher up convection diffusion front and is different to adults. And that may as well explain why HFO starts to fail in larger um, uh, uh, children. So what we have learned from here, or should learn, is that adults are not simply big children. Uh, the future research certainly needs now to focus on uh, trying to investigate that further, the so-called age dependency. Now, just to go back again to summarize what I've been just saying about pediatric lung recruitment, please do, uh, don't do it if it's not needed or reverse it nicely with some recruitment maneuver. But we have to accept as well that some patients are not fixable, and you can uh, try HFO, but in the end, some of them will end up on uh, respiratory ECMO. I'm happy to accept some questions. Thank you for your attention.